Today on Follow Our Lead, I'll be talking to Gemma Barbarese Kelly, co-founder and vice president of LifeBrand, a company that scrubs your social media. If they find something cringy, they'll flag the post and give you the ability to delete it, edit it, or just leave it. LifeBrand was started in 2018, employs over 50 people in the Westchester, Pennsylvania area, and is valued at $110 million. Gemma and I talk about how she went from leaving a six-figure salary to chase a concept, to overcoming imposter syndrome, to managing to stay effective in all areas of her life. I have so many things to ask you, and I feel like I'm extra nervous for some reason, and I think it's because we have a little bit of history. So we went to Franklin and Marshall College together. We were in the same grade, Um, and I read somewhere, Gemma, that you were the second woman in your family to attend college, and I'm sure that had to have impacted you in some way. So talk to us a little bit about that and kind of the influence of of F&M in your journey. Sure. So it's hard because I have so many educated women in my family, although they're not formally educated. So I hate to admit that I'm only the second to go to college, um, but it was really difficult, I think, to have that pressure um, when I was younger and applying to school because I didn't really have an adult that could help me figure out what that application process looked like, how I could pick the right school that would you know, fit my needs and what I wanted to do for my career. Um, my mom and I went on all of the college tours together and um, I fell in love with f and right away. I applied early decision, um, but I applied for a completely different reason than I ended up graduating. I thought I was going to be a dentist. Um, I actually applied thinking that I wanted to be a pediatric dentist. I'd had a lot of dental issues as a kid. It was my total like uh, package essay, everything. And um, when I graduated, I was pre-law and I had a business and philosophy degree, completely opposite. I loved the idea of privacy law. And um, a few of my professors really helped me get there, actually realizing that bio and chem were not my calling and that uh, being more abstract was. And I think it just helped me shape the way that I think. Um, I would have never been able to, you know, uh, start thinking outside of the box and and try to do something outside of the typical nine to five if I hadn't had professors like the ones at FNM push the boundaries and help me, you know, really try to figure out what my passions were outside of, you know, what I was told my passions should be. I think I, I feel very similar to you. I feel like, you know, FNM should definitely um, sponsor the next episode or they should 100% have you as a, as a graduation speaker one day. I feel like at least from my own experience, and it sounds like from yours too, the grit and the determination and the, I will not fail type of a mm-hmm. mentality. It's interesting though, that you did not um, initially go to school for what you thought. And I think a lot of people are in that same boat where we feel mm-hmm. like we have to have this this path in our mind, like, okay, I'm going to go to school for this. I'm going to follow through. I'm, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And we, we don't do it. And, and I think our career trajectories go in a way sometimes that we don't necessarily anticipate. And I think that happened for you, both in your, um, you know, your college experience, but also in your life. I mean, talk to us a little bit about like what you were doing before you started Life Brand and where you were in your life. So it's a little bit of a long story, but when I graduated, I first started working um, at a law firm in New York City, and I was working in bankruptcy law. So um, Lehman and MF Global, Republic Airways, um, all Chapter 11 cases, and I tried to figure out whether or not um, corporate law would be my thing. Again, I wanted um, to eventually get my JD. I graduated pre-law. It was a goal of mine. I loved privacy law so much more, but it was kind of the wild west when I first graduated because the internet, although not new, didn't have the same type of social media exposure that it does today. So I didn't really know if that was going to be possible. And if I wanted to do that, I figured corporate law is where I had to start. Well, after about a year and a half of working as a paralegal, um, I realized I didn't like corporate law at all. And maybe I could apply it somewhere else. So I worked at Goldman Sachs for a while, had an amazing time there. I worked for their uh, bank board of directors in their legal department. So adjacent to, you know, um, what I was doing before. But I got to actually see how bank policy was shaped, how the board of directors interacted with everything company wide. And I loved it. But again, it wasn't my passion. So I figured, okay, 
if I'm not going to be able to do the things that I love right away, I need to just go to grad school the way that I originally planned. So I moved to Philadelphia in 2017. Um, and when I was living in the Philadelphia area, I worked at a uh, lifetime athletic Ardmore as a personal training manager. Um, it was a fantastic time because I was a sales manager. I got to help develop people, build my own book of business, get the business exposure that I hadn't had before as I was working on all of these other like legal endeavors. And while I was applying to grad school, that's where I met TJ. So we met at Lifetime. He was in the shared workspace upstairs. And when he started telling me about LifeBrand, it wasn't real yet. It was just an idea, a couple wireframes, a dream. He was kind of building it, kind of not, trying to figure out where investment was coming from. And I immediately pounced because that's what I loved. I wanted to be a part of privacy law. And if I couldn't do it as a lawyer, I wanted to be a part of the change for other people on the other end. How can you control your own data? How can you be a part of the solution? And I stopped him. No joke. I say that word as, as you know, uh, to be funny, but it's true for a year for a job. Um, and when he finally gave in, I knew he couldn't afford to pay me. So I just quit my job. I worked for free and the rest was history. That's pretty amazing. I've heard you you say that before, and it was hilarious listening to it because that kind of grit and determination that you had, I think a lot of us would love to emulate, but are kind of afraid to. <laughs> and I think you you took a massive, massive risk. So during that initial time when you were like, he couldn't afford to pay you in the beginning, you decided to just like go out on a whim. You had no idea if this company was going to work or not. It could have been a massive fail. Absolutely. How did you support yourself? What made you decide like, okay, I'm going to just put everything to the wayside and just like give this a try? Sure. So um, there was no like fallback plan. I truly, I didn't give myself the opportunity to think of a plan B. I just said, well, it's going to work. <laughs> and I, you know, I know that that sounds crazy. Um, I especially know that it sounds crazy because none of my friends or my family or anybody thought that I was making the right decision. I was leaving a six-figure paying job, doing really well, huge book of business with a really large network of people who probably could have helped me work anywhere um, to go off with this madman with an idea that didn't really exist. And it was just going to be the two of us. Um, my offer letter initially said I was going to make um, basically half of what my salary was at Lifetime. And I told my parents that they were very upset, um, but they said if this was what I wanted, you know, hands off, whatever. <laughs> um, and then obviously he couldn't pay me. So I never told them that. What I told them was that I was making money and I wasn't. I was in severe credit card debt. I put my home on forbearance. And by the way, my first day of work was like two days before the original coronavirus shutdown. So we had nothing. We were in the middle of a fundraising round and we were supposed to have money coming in. But because of the shutdown, it all went to shit. Oh, sorry. I don't think I can say that. You can say that. You can totally say that. <laughs> it all went away. And um, it was really scary because the stock market crashed. You know, our investors weren't not giving us money because they didn't believe in us. It was because they didn't have the money to do it. So um, your initial question was, how did I support myself? It was really just ramen noodle, credit card debt, trying to figure it out. And it kind of came together. Eventually, I hate saying that coronavirus was good for us because it wasn't really good for anybody, but the contention that started during coronavirus was good for us because it was proof of concept. People, when they have a little too much to drink, a little too much time on their hands, and not a lot to lose, post whatever they're thinking and feeling, and it immediately showed why LifeBrand was so important because coronavirus wasn't forever. We didn't sit in our homes for, you know, um, the rest of our lives. It was only a couple months. And then we had to go back in person and be around one another and own up to what we said online. And I think everyone was a little bit afraid at that point because they said a little too much. So people really started believing in the product and it just kind of went from there. Now, it was really hard. Don't get me wrong, but it worked out. <laughs> I mean, first of all, there's so much to unpack there, but I will tell you, I love the story about your parents because I would probably do the exact same thing or that sort of like, you know, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I'm going to try it. And I think that that's um, something really unique. But what do you think was the turning point for LifeBrand? So we talked a little, you mentioned a little bit about the coronavirus. I feel like LifeBrand kind of took it to the next level. 
Sure. So I think it was a turning point for, you know, our investors initially, right? Coronavirus. I don't think that's where the the company really had its credibility. Um, for me, the turning point was seeing our sign in Citizens Bank Park. That was the first partnership we had done. And to see Life Brand next to Toyota, a huge legacy brand, I mean, melted my brain. I, I actually, which is so stupid, teared up when I saw it because it had meant, oh my God, we've kind of made it a little bit, right? We have a long way to go, but it just made me feel like this is a permanent sign in a huge stadium and now we can't fail, right? We're too big to fail at this point, even though we're still really tiny. Um, I think the turning point for us as a company was finishing our Series A and oversubscribing. That was a huge milestone for us. The valuation that we received, the amount of money that we received, the credibility that came with it, the people who joined our board because of it. I mean, that's when we really gained legitimacy. And I think now have something to fight for in terms of, you know, building towards a series B and beyond. I agree with you about the sports team thing, because I will say I had heard of life brand because of you. I follow you on social mm -hmm. media. So I've seen every time you would post about it, I would see it. So it wasn't new to me. Um, but for other people, like my husband, for example, he recognized the life brand, you know, logo from the sports team. So I think you're spot on there. I think it became something that, you know, people associate, like they saw that purple and they instantly thought life brand. And I think when you see your logo that, or I, yeah, honestly, even when I see like a, a long rectangle with the color purple, I automatically mm -hmm. think of you. Um, but I feel like, you know, being at the time, like not a massive company, you, you had to have taken some sort of a leap to decide that you were going to partner with many of these sports teams. And, you know, we talked about Citizens Bank Park, but you've also partnered with like the Eagles, the 76ers, I mean, teams that are even outside of our Philadelphia area. So how do you think partnering with sports teams and athletes helped you? And how did you even kind of start with start building those partnerships early on? Sure. So I think the benefit was was twofold for us, right? Um, the initial benefit was having the exposure. Just like you said, your husband recognized us from being in Citizens Bank Park. Um, it builds credibility. When you're selling a service to businesses, yeah, the businesses might buy it, but are there people going to use it without understanding what you are and what a benefit you could be to them and their families? Probably not, especially when you're touching such intimate, you know, pieces of their lives, like their social media history. And I'm going to digress for a second. I'm sorry, I'm going to like, you know, tell a little aside for a second, but I kind of a like in life brand to looking in someone's underwear drawer, right? It's if I went into your home, your underwear drawer has clean pieces of clothing in it. There shouldn't be anything embarrassing about it, but it still feels icky, me even talking about it. It's your personal underwear drawer. Why would I go and do that? They're laundered. There's nothing wrong with them. It's very much like that when we're looking at someone's social media history. It's private. It's intimate. And although there might not be anything there that could be considered a skeleton, it's still a piece of their life and their history that they might not want to share, right? Right away, especially with somebody that they don't trust. So, we partnered with these sports teams to really have that credibility, that B2C buy-in, to make sure that our B2B clients had the best um, customer, uh, excuse me, the, the best um, activation with the people that worked for them to make sure that it wasn't just, you know, bad revenue. They were buying a service that their people weren't going to use. We really wanted to become a part of their company ecosystems and offer their employees something that gave them a benefit that also helped the employer. The second piece of this, though, really is to get um, in front of the other corporate partners. You know, when you look at what some of the corporate partners are of the Sixers, the Eagles, the Phillies, an Aramark, for example, can only be used by a fraction of them, right? Because a lot of them don't have catering services. They're not going to continue to, you know, offer catering services now that a lot of people are working from home for their employees. It could change. Social media is something that every single employee of every single corporate partner uses. And to have the credibility of being in a stadium like that, to meet their corporate partners, and then to start to move forward and sell to those corporate partners was a big deal for us. Little old life brand calling Citizens Bank to you know have them use our services would have never happened. But now we've built a really close relationship with the reps from Citizens Bank. We are 
hopefully very close to moving forward. And things like that wouldn't have happened again without the credibility of being there. I think it was kind of kismet that it happened. You know, they they reached out to us first, but the strategy really moved forward as TJ and I tried to figure out how we could kind of old school dorm storm like we used to in college, but in the easiest way in the Philadelphia market. And what better than Philadelphia sports? I mean, do you think that obviously our sports teams did absolutely amazing this year um, and they've been pretty good um, since you've partnered with them. Do you think that them being so exceptional, and I'm not just saying that they actually are, but do you think that that had anything to do with this strategy or do you think that even if they weren't as awesome as they are, mm-hmm. would would this still have worked? Um, wow, what a good question. I think it still would have worked, especially in the Philadelphia area, because Philly fans are just diehard fans. Even when their, their teams suck, they want to be a part of that culture no matter what. It's much better when they're winning. Don't get me wrong, but you're still going to turn on the TV. You're still going to watch the Sixers. You're still going to watch the Phillies, the Eagles, because you just have that much pride. Would it have worked with some other markets? Maybe not. There are some other fair weather fans, but I don't think Philadelphia is one of those cities. Um, But we've been very careful about where we've invested our time and money in these partnerships. And they truly are just in cities where we feel like we can have the best hold, hire people to help us, you know, build the brand and, and move it forward. I think it's so smart. I don't know of another company that uses the sports market the way that you guys are using it right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know of another brand doing that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen it, but I think it's really interesting. So um, we might get back to that topic, but I, I think it's really cool. A lot of people listening to this podcast maybe have an idea like the way that TJ kind of had that idea about life brand, but they're not really sure like what's the first step in executing that. So they have this idea, where do they go? Oh man. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to pretend to be, you know, a subject matter expert because certainly like TJ and I, this is our first business endeavor together, but, um, you have to start with burning the boats. You know, I did talk about the risk that I took and and he also took as big a risk, if not bigger, because he had children at the time, a wife, a house. I had only had my little tiny twin. It was me, my dog. Um, So it was very different, but you can't give yourself a fallback. You have to make sure that if this is your passion, you're moving forward with your passion. And the best way to do that, I think, is to also try to look for people who have done it before. And if it's not exactly your idea because no one's come up with a life brand before, right? At least people who have some exposure in the same space. So our partners, when we first started that helped us build the website, build the product came to us because of a connection that he used to work with. You know, one of his friends, their brother-in-law started a development company. They had, you know, engineers overseas. And that's how he started moving that forward before we met. You need to make sure that you surround yourself with people that just are willing to help, have the right you know, um, resources in front of them. And if they're not going to take advantage of you, because unfortunately, some people try to in business, you move forward with their help as much as you can and then continue to surround yourself with smarter people than you, because you're just never going to make the right decisions unless you have a good support system. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I think, um, you know, you touched on this a little bit, but the people in your network and mentorship and, and the importance of having those key people in your circle. I don't know that people, I think some people value that, but I don't know that people really understand like the difference that somebody else could make who's walked that walk before you. Um, and I hope that, you know, these, these episodes show people that, you know, you, you can get to where you want to go. You can be where you were, um, take a massive risk and then end up where you are now, which is pretty amazing. Um, I think that we, you're a young woman, obviously you started this from nothing with TJ. We talk a lot about imposter syndrome in the leadership space. Um, And for those who are listening that don't know what it is, essentially it's a perceived fraudulence. You feel like you're going to be found out that you're not really who you say you are. You you doubt your abilities. So being a woman under 30 or 30, um, you reached massive success. Has this been something you felt? Absolutely. 
every day. And not because I doubt my own abilities, but because I feel like the world isn't shaped for people that are me. You know, there are no female executives that I know of at my age that have, well, I shouldn't say that. There are a few that exist, but there are none that I know directly in, you know, my six degrees of separation. I don't have exposure to those people. And have I seen them in the news? Sure. Are they role models? Absolutely. Have I had, you know, any personal conversations with them? Have I been able to learn from them? No. So as much as I believe in myself and I know that I've earned this position, I've never had somebody that looks like me, that sounds like me, that's my age say, you're doing an incredible job. Here's where I have messed up before. Here's how you can learn from me. And here's how you move forward with your career. I've just kind of had to figure it out. And you know, I don't want to say that entrepreneurship is a big boys club, but every piece of every business has that element to it. So it's even more uncomfortable when I am not only the youngest, but the only female in the room. 90 something percent of the time. So there's a little bit more work I have to do to be taken seriously. And although I don't really stress about it anymore at this stage, you know, of life brand, I used to a lot because I just felt like I'm the little girl walking into the room that no one's going to take seriously. And I'm asking for a couple million dollars. And how the hell is anyone going to give that to me when I'm trying to pitch them this idea? And since I've gotten over those fears, do I experience it, you know, as much? No, but there are still moments in my day where I think, oh my God, I've never done this before. But the secret is no one's ever done anything before and you, they have to just move forward. Everything's always going to be a new experience. And if you've done it before, you're not pushing yourself hard enough to continue to grow or you're at the end of your career and Godspeed, I hope I get there soon, but you know, we're not there. <laughs> um, now women tend to overvalue their expertise, meaning like they have to learn more or they have to do more before they take risks. Yeah. I am number one, that per I am that person. I feel like I can't do this thing because I didn't do enough research or I didn't do enough planning or I just don't know enough. I have to read more. I can't do this thing. And then by the time I'm ready to do it, two years have passed and I'm like, mm, do I really want to do that anymore? No. And I feel like a lot of women are in that same boat. For you though, I feel, I mean, and I could be wrong, but it, it seems like you, that didn't happen for you because you sort of jumped into this really not knowing you, you did have, you know, some background, you worked at Goldman Sachs, you, you worked at um, Lifetime. So you had, you know, some business acume in the, in the background, but it's not like you had 40 years of experience jumping into this, like, mm -hmm. you know, other people may have had. So why do you think that is like, why do you think you don't fall into this, like, overvalue expertise category, or maybe sure. you do. I think, I think I did initially, like when I first, you know, started working with TJ, I, um, I was a salesperson, the only salesperson. And I think I really fell back on, you know, my sales experience from lifetime. And although I wasn't doing what I had done before, um, it still felt like I could do it because I had some experience in it. Um, but as I moved forward, um, I think I've just been on this journey of self-acceptance and really just trying to be like the best version of myself. It sounds corny, but in my late twenties, I just, I just don't really give an F anymore. Like I, I really just want to be as true to myself as I can be. And I know that I have a lot to offer, so I might not have all the answers by any means, but I feel like I can get there as long as I'm trying really hard. I'm, I'm trying in earnest, right? I'm really trying to do my best. And I just look at the people around me and they don't really know what they're doing either. There's no shot at, you know, my, my network, my business partner, the people that, you know, I surround myself every day with, but everyone's kind of faking it till they make it. That's why that phrase exists. And if you really believe the hype about yourself, I think you can do almost anything. Um, it also is, you know, it was ingrained in me from a young age that I just had to really think about how valuable I was. You know, when I was a toddler, my dad would always like, it was a cute little like three line rhyme that he would repeat to me and make me repeat back to him. But he'd say, you're pretty, you're smart, and you have a really big heart. Um, and it stuck with me. And I know that, you know, it's, it seems very simple because he was saying it to a toddler, but it just has helped me realize that I have so much to offer. And 
even if I don't have the exact experience I need for a situation, I know that I can figure out the answer either with the right people around me or with the right, the right amount of work. And I'm sick of waiting for opportunities to come to me. I want to go and take them. I think that's incredible advice. And it's so interesting because the more I've been doing these podcasts, the more I'm hearing the same type of theme of nobody really knows what they're doing. I think mm-hmm. we're under this I don't know, at least for me, I, I think that people are are just automatically experts in a certain area. And I think we forget mm-hmm. that, you know, initially they might not be. And they get to this point where they become the expert because they've built this massive, you know, business or organization or whatever it may be. But I think it's so interesting that almost everybody we have, I have interviewed so far has said very similar things that you just said. And I th- I think right. it's inspiring for people listening that they can really do whatever they want to do. They have to just do it. And mm-hmm. I think um, taking that initial step of feeling like I am good enough, like I don't need to be the best right away. I can, I can figure it out. Something that I'm curious about is the technology piece. I mean, you didn't come from a tech background, so that had to have been really challenging for you. Oh yeah. (laughs) How did you, how how could you learn that? Like, did you ever feel like intimidated? I'm not going to be able to do this. This is way over my head. And how did you kind of overcome that? Yes. Intimidated still to this day when I talk to some of our engineers, because I know how smart they are. And I just, they are these incredible minds that I will just never understand. Um, I wasn't so much scared about working in tech because I didn't have the exposure. I I wasn't going to be doing any of the coding. So I felt comfortable really bringing my expertise to the table in terms of user experience. I love technology. I love social media. There are a lot of gripes about it too, right? But I love what it does. It brings people together. And I feel like because I've spent so much time trying to understand, again, to go back to privacy law, what the shortcomings and the strengths of each social media outlet are, I could bring that to the table when talking to our engineering teams and saying what the user experience should be, what the actual interface should look like, how we could compete with other outlets out there. I've learned so much from all of them and I really appreciate the minds that we have on staff because we really do have some of the best technological minds in the tri-state area. Um, I learn from them all the time, but I don't know. It took a little bit of getting used to really just kind of, again, taking it all in and not pretending to know something that I didn't. But I think Sometimes engineers are looking at it because they are doing the surgery on the tech and trying to make it all function, but they need someone else from the outside to remind them of what the functionality should represent to the users. And I really felt comfortable bringing that to the table. And I think too, you bring up a good point of, you know, the importance of having so many different people at the table Mm -hmm. with different backgrounds, different expertise, um, different experiences. And, you know, for you being somebody young, a woman, um, you had a whole different set of issues to overcome and more so probably than the average male in your, in your shoes. I know from my own experience being young and you're in a room of people who have more experience or have life experience, but also business experience. And you, at least for me, I, I sometimes find myself like retreating. Um, you know, how do you kind of engage with people who may have already kind of written you off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think about this a lot because, you know, it still happens once in a while. Um, But I think I just make myself impossible to ignore, especially in those rooms when I know people are going to look at me and think, there's nothing I need to talk to her about. Um, I hyper prepare for those meetings and I anticipate what those questions are going to be from them. And I make sure I have my own set of very difficult questions to ask them because let's say this is a business negotiation of sorts, just like they're vetting me, I need to make sure they're the right partner for me and my business as well. And if I'm not asking the right questions, I can't make sure that I'm doing my due diligence appropriately. If they're writing me off, they're probably not the right partner, to be fair. But it really did take some getting used to, to not take it personally. I know that it feels personal in those moments, but it's because their views are so myopic. They're not allowing themselves to really understand that someone like me has value to bring. And I need to just prove it in that moment. 
I don't try very hard to prove it in that moment. I try to, you know, allow it to just kind of flow. I used to try really hard. Um, but preparing for those meetings, making sure I have the right questions, making sure that I can have all the right answers. And if I don't know the answer, admitting it. Because I think people can feel when you don't know something and you try to fill the silence. And that's where you lose credibility, even if you didn't have it in the first place. It's so true. And it's so funny when you were talking, I wrote down the word personal because I wanted to know how you don't take it personal. I struggle with this. And I think a lot of people do like, how do you kind of separate like the personal from the business or just, you know, somebody's just being a jerk and mm -hmm. like, how do you not go home and sit on that? I've gotten a lot better with it, but I feel like it's so hard not to. <laughs> there are moments where I definitely still take it personally. They're, they're not as often. Um, but I think it's really trying to understand that everyone comes from their own world that I'm never going to understand. They might have had the worst day ever before being in front of me. Maybe I said something that rubbed them the wrong way and I didn't realize, even if I didn't mean to, because of the experience they had before speaking to me. Maybe it's just that they hate people that look like me. I don't know. There could be a million reasons, but I know that I'm not the person that started that issue. It's them. It lives with them. It dies with them. And I'm probably not going to see them after that conversation. So I don't know. It took me a while because I really did take work home and sometimes still do. But my husband and I talk every night about what our days are. And I try really hard to focus on the positives because if I focus on all the negative pieces of my day, I would never want to come back to work again. There's just so much stuff that happens. Um, but when I focus on the positives, I really think about the impact that I've made in certain conversations or the impact that I've made in certain one-on-ones with my employees or the way that the business is moving forward. And it just keeps me coming back to work instead of focusing on all the reasons why I should hate it. And, you know, there are a lot for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. So I'll tell you something that I've really struggled with in recent years is that I have trouble public speaking. It has been something I never had an issue with as like a kid or even into my teens in college, never had a problem. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in the business world and I have a trouble with it. So I think personally, that probably reverts back to my own imposter syndrome. Sure. But likely you've had to do a lot of public speaking. You've had to network with very important people, professional athletes, people who have a ton of money to invest in your company. Mm -hmm. There's a lot at stake for you. So how do you overcome the anxiety of not putting your foot in your mouth? Sure. Um, oh, sometimes it still happens, but I have to kind of tell myself that like, I'm the <laughs> like, I, I know this like, sounds nuts, but if you don't kind of believe your own hype before you go into those meetings, before you go into those presentations, those people, if you are the one presenting, are coming to see you. They really care about what you have to say, and they're just as nervous listening to you as you are going to speak to them. So I've really started to get over that. I had a presentation not long ago to one of the G League teams for you know, an NBA team in the area. And when I walked in, I was very nervous before I had started talking. And then I stood in the locker room and I was like, I'm here to tell these guys how amazing I am and how amazing my product is. I'm not nervous anymore. They're just kids. And I really just want to have a good time. It should be a good time. They're coming to listen to be educated. In networking situations, I know that there are, you know, professional athletes, celebrities that have invested in the company or that I might have exposure to at networking events. But I don't really get excited about that anymore. It makes me sound jaded. It truly does. And there are some very exciting moments, but I try to think about them as business people and as humans and how I would want to be treated on the other end of that conversation. And that's how I approach it. Because if I get nervous or I fangirl over them, I immediately lose any chance I had of having that credibility in that conversation or making them feel comfortable. So um, it's taken some practice. Don't get me wrong, but you just have to hype yourself up and really feel like you have so much to add that they would be stupid not to listen to you. I love that advice. I'm going to, if anybody hears me saying these words, they're going to know it came from you. Um, I love that. I'm still going to put my foot in my mouth. I'm oh, sure. Yeah. I'm it's sure. Gonna happen. A lot of people are age when I have these conversations of like, what's the hardest thing in your career? What's the mm -hmm. biggest obstacle you have to overcome? So many people our age are like public speaking. You don't seem to have that. And if you do, I don't feel it. So. <laughs> Thank you. I do definitely get nervous, but I also think that, um, 
my version of preparing for things, and I think other people's version of preparing for things is very different. You know, when I get sent, um, you know, an outline that I have to go over with somebody when I'm, I'm doing a presentation or, or whatever it looks like, I try to dissect that as much as possible and just give myself really short bullet points because I have to leave enough room for people to ask me questions. But I also want to leave enough room to like riff if the room is completely different. Maybe I'm talking about something that's totally irrelevant. I don't want to get stuck on just one thing that I've prepared that might not be relevant to that group of people. So I don't know. I think our age group, I go back to like third, fifth grade when we were really trying to understand how to write five paragraph essays, whatever that was. And we really got stuck on every paragraph needs a subject, you need to have a conclusion, whatever. The structure kind of messed with us. We didn't allow ourselves to just kind of flow and riff and, and have enough space to be creative for the room that you were in or the people that you might be talking to. I think that is so spot on and so funny looking back at that you know, the PSSAs and all those things mm -hmm. we had to, you know, take, I guess it was different for you where you live, but the, the standardized tests for yeah. um, public school kids was the same. And and I remember them saying, you know, you had to have a topic sentence and then yes. all your sentences underneath had to add to that topic. And now it's totally different. You know, I, I'm learning, you know, being in the marketing space, the, the website writing is so different than the way we were taught. And business memos even are so different than the way we were taught. Um, and it seems like nowadays people are, there is no sort of like status quo, like there's nothing to really look at. I mean, even in the PR space, you know, there, of course there's the AP style book, but does everybody, is everybody familiar with that? No. I mean, if you forget where to put a comma, are people going to notice? Probably not. Like, you know, so it's so interesting that um, things have evolved and, you know, we've, we've kind of grown out of this, standard that we set for mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, but I want to talk about something that was on your website. So you had said on your website that your personal mission is to lead a professional life of honesty and integrity mm -hmm. while encouraging failure recovery over failure avoidance. I love this saying. So how did you come up with that statement and how do you think you've been able to achieve that? Sure. So it's it's twofold. My dad, when I was growing up, had his own business and their mission statement uh, was integrity in action. And I loved that. Um, and I think I've really tried to lead with that. I try to do the right thing every day, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, but sometimes doing the right thing gets me in trouble and I totally screw up. And that's where the failure recovery and failure avoidance piece came from. It's really the first thing I wrote um, to remind myself when we started Life Brand. I think I still, yeah, I mean, I would turn my computer, but I have the post-it still on one of my chargers over by my computer. I've had it since 2020. Um, I just... I don't know. You have to make sure that you're trying everything and then apologizing after if it's wrong, not asking for permission, because if you're always waiting for someone else's permission, you're never going to move forward. You just kind of have to throw spaghetti against a wall and see if it sticks while also doing the right thing and having the right intentions and making sure that everything you do is leading your company and your people in the direction that you believe is right. And if it's not right, you got to own the mistake and you have to make sure that your people see you owning the mistake. Because if you lead by example and you show that every leader is fallible, it also makes you more believable. It makes you more followable. It makes people gravitate towards you. Does everybody like me? No, probably not. And I hope not because that means I've done something wrong. But I would hope that they respect me because I can honor when I've made a mistake, tell the people that told me I was making a mistake they were right, and absolutely come back to them to help um, fix the problem and make sure that I have the right people there next to me. So like I said, twofold. My dad really started that. Um, he, he has a lot of cute catchphrases that he's been using since I was little. Um, but integrity in action really stuck with me. And I wanted to make that a part of, you know, my personal mission statement. I mean, it's really great advice. And, you know, I think it shows the authenticity of you as a leader. I think it's really hard sometimes for executives to come down a little bit and, and be able to kind of relate to their staff in a way that makes them feel like humans, like, like mm -hmm. people that they can relate to. So I want to talk a little bit about your role at LifeBrand. What 
what does your day to day look like? Are you overseeing the people? Are you overseeing just the operations? Like what, what does your day to day look like? Mm -hmm. So my day to day is different every day, which really is my favorite part of the job. I I never know what to expect coming in. Um, Even if there's stuff on my calendar, (laughs) it could be gone in a moment's notice, but my job, yes, is to oversee the operations of the company, make sure that our day-to-day, you know, vendor, excuse me, vendor relations, our data science, you know, everything is moving forward, our product and technology team. But I meet with all of our department heads once a week to make sure that I understand the inner workings of the company. If I am only looking at data or I'm only looking at what our vendors are doing or only looking at, you know, certain KPIs and I'm hiding from our people, I'm missing the biggest part of operations because I'm not the one that makes the company run. TJ is not the one that makes the company run. It's everyone else that we've hired. Those departments are much more important than anyone else that sits on my floor. So I need to make sure I have personal touch points with them. So every week, yes, I'm looking at, you know, all of these other numbers, but I have a lot of personal one-on-one time with department heads. And I also have open office hours on my calendar from eight to 10 every morning where anybody who's not a department head who doesn't have an appointment can come see me, make time and make sure that we have, you know, that one-on-one FaceTime. Um, In addition to, you know, all of those one-on-ones and appointments and other meetings, I also have time, you know, each Wednesday afternoon to sit with the whole company. We have, whether it's like team bonding moments, scavenger hunts, pizza parties, whatever that might be to make sure that we really are sharing in the mission. Um, I think it's important that everyone stays connected because if one person is unhappy, all of life brand becomes unhappy because we're so small and because we're a startup, we really rely so heavily on each role that's involved here. We need to make sure that everyone is connected and feels comfortable enough to share either, you know, what's going well or what's not going well. How do you think you build that comfortability with them? I mean, that's gotta be very hard. And I'm sure that even though you're, you are very approachable in my opinion, I'm sure there's probably people who are very intimidated by you. How do you, how do you overcome that? How do you build that? I mean, this is a loaded yeah. question here, but how do you build that, like, yeah. that culture that you're talking I think, about? I think my employees, um, they know that I will always keep it real. They will always know where they stand, whether it's positive or it's negative. I'm not going to hide it from them. So I think even if that has an intimidation factor, it makes me more approachable because they know that they're not just going to get lip service and that they'll get my real opinion. And if I don't give it to them, my face will give it to them. So no matter what, they know where they stand. Um, I think building that culture though started from the beginning. We had a one floor office where everyone had open door policy. We truly spent as much time as we could together. There was a lot of collaboration, no matter what you were, whether you were on the engineering team, on the marketing team, somewhere in finance, we wanted everyone's opinions on the product. All of those meetings, I think, helped shape the culture where people could feel comfortable enough to talk about what was going on at the company that they liked and they didn't like. I also started this cute like half hour to an hour meeting on Wednesdays where um, we talk about anything other than work. So we literally just sit together and sometimes I come with topics, sometimes we have an activity, but it's just to make sure there's no life brand talk and we are actually getting to know one another personally. Now, whether or not my employees enjoy that, you'd have to ask them, but I think it's worked so far um, because we really do enjoy spending time together. I mean, I, I hate when when decision makers call their business a family. We're not a family. We're people that work together. We have to refer to each other as family because we are a very small, tight-knit community. Um, But we do choose to see each other outside of work. So I guess that would be the biggest measure of success. It's that everybody here has somebody from this office that they see on a regular basis, want to spend time with, and choose to be around, even though they're there for 40 to 60 hours a week in front of that same person over and over again. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, wow, that's got to take up a lot of your time and it's time well spent, but it also leads me to think like, how are you able to manage your time in a way that when you go home, you're not constantly working and maybe you're still working on this because it's got to be really challenging. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is twofold. You know, how do you handle the time management piece of being somebody in your shoes, but also how do you separate your home life from your work life, or is there none? (laughs) Um, 
I think my husband would tell you there's no separation, even though I would like to say the opposite. Um, but I think when, when a business is your baby, there can't really be any separation, right? I go home and I have personal time and there are hours where no, I won't look at my phone. Um, but I know that I have to, if it's important, right? Because no one's ever going to care about my business the way that I care, the way that TJ cares about life brand. Um, but how do I manage my schedule effectively? I think I built really good habits when I was at Lifetime. I have to credit my last manager, Dan Kubo, with that. He drilled home a highly effective schedule. So if you were to look at my Google Calendar, I mean, it's insane. I will block every half hour, every hour on the hour. It's either my meetings, it's whatever I'm doing admin-wise, it's whatever I'm focused on. I want people to know, even if it's not a meeting, that I'm writing what I'm doing so that I can hold myself accountable and that my employees can hold me accountable for what work I need to get done. But I go as far as to even write little reminders like bring your Tupperware home <laughs> so that everything is there and nothing can be missed. Work will come home with me once in a while. Yeah, I will work late. Um, you know, my husband will say a lot of other things, but um, I really try to use my time as valuable, excuse me, as as valuably as possible and as effectively as possible when I'm in the building, because if I don't, I'll never stop. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i amazed by how you're <laughs> able to sort of juggle it all because there's a lot there. Um, but I know we're getting close to the end here. So I wanna ask you two more questions before we close yeah. out. The first one is, um, how has your life changed since life brand? I mean, you're talking about, you know, your life did a full 360. You went from leaving your job, cutting your salary in half, not even having a salary to being part of and helping to build this massive, massive company. So talk to us about the positives and the negatives of, of about how your life changed. Sure. I think, you know, instead of referring to them as negatives, I'll say challenges, right? The like biggest that. challenge I have now is feeling responsible for 50 people. <laughs> every day, it's not just my livelihood, it's 50 people. And every day that I think, oh my God, I'm not going to work today. I'm pissed at everybody and I really just need a break. I think, no, my employees are there. They need me. They need to see a smiling face. They need to know that I'm as dedicated as they are. And whatever happens, you know, on the executive floor with fundraising, with revenues, with our KPIs, whatever it might be, I will never show my stress downstairs to my employees. I want them to know that even if my hair is on fire, they are my priority, their comfortability, the work that they're putting forward, their livelihood is always going to be what I'm focused on. So, it feels like I have 50 children, even though I don't have children yet. Um, so I'd say that's the biggest challenge. I don't want to call it a negative. It's just an added stress that I should have seen coming, you know, when we started the business, but I don't think I could have ever anticipated feeling that stress and, and feeling that agita when I think about, you know, how many people I have to make sure remain happy because it's not just them, it's their families too. Um, the biggest positive change I think is the one uh, I've seen in myself. I mean, before life brand, um, I think I really just wanted to find my purpose and I really just wanted to fit into whatever business I was working in, do the best I could, which is great, but I wasn't fulfilled. And now, although there are challenges, I feel fulfilled every day because it's something that I really care about and it's something that I really want to see through. Um, so it's the biggest positive, but also I just feel like I have so much more autonomy. I feel like I can speak up and be valued in a room where before I was taught, you are an analyst, you do not speak unless spoken to. There are other VPs and MDs in the room that you need to make sure you're listening to first. Don't ask questions till after. Just a lot of weird, bad habits that I don't think really should exist. I think that there are so many good ideas that can come from anybody, no matter their title, and I really try to stress that with my people. So I I tried to push that as much in myself to make sure I led by example. I mean, I totally, I feel like so many people listening are like, wow, I really wish I had a boss <laughs> like that. I really wish I had somebody in my corner like that because I think that that's the way it should always be. Um, but something you talked about when we talked about challenges challenges with life brand. Um, we talked about that added stress of mm -hmm. you know feeling the employees on your on your back and feeling like you know your decisions are directly impacting them and their families. Yeah. So 
And that's just one of the many, many stresses that I'm sure come along with the job. But how are you dealing with the stress of this job? Sure. I mean, it takes a lot of um, time management, but it also takes a lot of self-care. And I don't mean self-care like what you see in the movies when you stand in the bathroom and you put your little mask on, although sometimes that's a part of it. It really is making sure you're investing in the things that make you happy outside of work. So for me, that's my family, my friends, my pets, um, my husband, it's my hobbies. So it's golfing, it's horseback riding, it's reading, it's sitting in my backyard in the grass and just enjoying some sun light when I can, even if my laptop has to be next to me. It's making sure that my cup is filled because if it's not, I'm not going to be able to fill those around me and I'm not going to be able to be 100% for the people that depend on me. So self-care is huge. Um, And then just also letting go. I had a really hard time letting go when we first started Life Brand. And TJ is the same way. We're both control freaks. So for us to delegate and give, you know, homework to other people that we really felt like we could do better something we had to really fight through. Um, But that's helped with my stress management because I trust my people. I needed to learn that and I needed to give my people autonomy the way that I've been trusted with autonomy. So that's also really helped with my stress management. This has been so helpful and I've loved getting the chance to ask you all these questions. And I feel like I could potentially be on this call with you for another two hours, but that would totally mess up your (laughs) time block. We can always do this whenever you want. (laughs) I think it would mess up your time block. I think it really would. would You would have to time block me for an entire day. I mean, you would would be stressed. You would need self-care after that. Um, But is there anything else you want to share or something we didn't talk about before we kind of wrap it up? Sure. I mean... I think just how grateful I am for all of the opportunities I've been given. I know that I've said a lot on this podcast that I've fought for a lot of the opportunities, and and I have, but I am very grateful for having the belief of my business partner, for having family and friends that really supported me even when it was hard and it didn't look like LifeBrain was going to make it. And I just owe a lot of people a lot of thank yous. And I don't think I get to say it enough. So I'm saying a blanket thank you right now. But I think all those people know who they are. And I just like to always include that because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for everyone else that helped me get here. Well, Gemma, I am so, so grateful and thankful for you for being on this podcast. This has been so exciting for me. Um, This is something that I've always wanted to do. And you're part of my journey now. Thank you again, Gemma. And hopefully we'll be seeing each other soon. Yes. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. As you can hear from listening to Gemma, she is eloquent, empathetic, driven, and very strategic. Her story from making no money to building a $110 million brand came with risks and uncertainty, but that little voice inside her head, thanks to her dad's affirmations, helped her develop a mindset that shaped her career trajectory and her leadership style. I challenge you to focus on failure recovery over failure avoidance and work on believing your own hype. And of course, if you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe so we can continue to provide content from exceptional leaders.